A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. We are recording this on March 31st, 2021. I'm your host, Anna Garcia, and our guest today is criminal defense attorney Mike Cavaluzzi, a friend of the program. Welcome back, Mike. Thanks for having me back. I understand you have a holiday today. Oh, you don't well, have to I don't have a holiday. I don't have to go to court. But oh. I still have to work, but I had a little time this morning, so I was just catching up on my legal news. <laughs> ah, I love it. I love it. Okay, well, we've got some great cases this week. Um, a suspect that is accused of killing a New Jersey man and considered a person of interest in at least four other deaths, and that would be in New Mexico, which includes his ex-wife, it's really a convoluted case, has allegedly confessed to killing a total of 16 people. So I'm really worried we have the a potential here for a serial killer, because that's an awful lot of people to admit to killing. But first, we have new details on the murder of six-year-old James Hutchinson. Mike, this is a case that we covered in a previous episode, but because so many new details have been released now because of the indictment, we felt that we really wanted to update everyone because it's a horrendous crime. It is, yeah. It's just one one of the worst that we've seen. And, and, you know, sometimes when you report the details of a murder case, you think to yourself, my Lord, this is so horrific. I can't imagine it being worse well, it actually is in this case. It's even worse than we imagined, and it was pretty horrific. So this is, of course, the case of six-year-old James Hutchinson of Ohio. He was abandoned and then run over, allegedly, by his mother. And these latest details have been released from the prosecutor's office. 29-year-old Brittany Gosney is accused of killing her six-year-old son, James, last month we believe on February 26. Also charged in his murder is Brittany's boyfriend, 43-year-old James Hamilton. And Mike, the motivation, because one can never figure out what, what is the motivation behind a parent trying to allegedly rid themselves of not just James, but his two siblings. Yeah. Apparently, now this is what the prosecutor is saying, her boyfriend really didn't like the kids and just wanted them gone. So she was going to permanently get rid of them. It's like the Susan Smith case from many, many years ago where she drove her car into a body of water to kill her two children um, in order to satisfy a boyfriend who didn't want to have children. It's insane. It is insane. And insanity is going to work its way in here because that's, of course. that's what she is claiming. Her defense attorney is claiming that's also new. Um, let's get into the charges. And now let's get into the new details. These two, the couple, they have been slapped with a combined 31 count indictment. Previously, the boyfriend had not been charged with the boy's murder, but now he is. So both are charged with murder. They're also facing additional charges that include various forms of child endangerment because of what was allegedly done to Brittany's two other children. Apparently the plan was, according to authorities, to kill all three. This took place in Middletown, Ohio. It's a small town. It's about less than 50,000 people. So you can imagine everybody kind of knows each other. And this is about a half hour north of Cincinnati to, to give you an idea regionally what we're talking about. So this is the murderous plot, according to court records. Brittany and her boyfriend, over the course of two days, Mike tortured the children, allegedly hog-tying the children, including six-year-old James. His brother and sister, ages seven and nine, who does this, tied their hands behind their backs, put cloths or rags inside the children's mouths, and they stayed like this, allegedly, for hours. That in itself is horrendous. Yes, so here's the plan, according to the police chief. The plan was to take the three children and dump them at a wildlife area. And she allegedly confessed to doing all of this, which is also a very interesting component of this case, her confession, and whether that will be admissible. Because we don't believe that there was an attorney present at the time of this confession. Does that matter? 
Oh, it could matter. It depends on how they read her her rights and whether or not she understood and willingly gave up those rights. Because uh, Miranda warnings require that prior to taking a statement from somebody under arrest, the peop- the police must advise them of their right to remain silent and their right to an attorney. So a couple things that need to be considered is, did she request an attorney? Did she invoke her rights? And the police continued asking questions anyway. Did they fail to read her, her Miranda rights? Or if she's in a compromised state of mind, was she incapable of fully understanding and waiving those rights? So those will be the issues as to whether or not the statement comes in. There is not an absolute right to have an attorney present when being questioned by the police. I do believe this is going to be a huge part of the prosecution and the defense because, and we're going to play this clip in a little bit, at her very first court appearance, she said to the judge, I don't understand what's going on because I have a learning disability. And so I felt like these were the seeds that were being planted. At that point, she didn't have an attorney. One had not been appointed to her yet. She seemed very confused by everything. The police chief has said, oh, no, she knows the difference between right and wrong. And a learning disability is far different from any other afflictions or mental illness that she may or may not have. That's correct. Right? So, Absolutely. So what, is, what is critical is whether or not she knew right from wrong and can act on the basis of those beliefs of what was right and what was wrong. And there are a lot of very troubling facts here for the defense in terms of the planning, um, because that goes to whether or not you know something is right right or wrong is how you plan the offense. And also the efforts made to hide evidence in the case, which sh- which could show that in fact, both individuals knew what they were doing was wrong and took the steps to hide it. Yeah, there's a lot that's troubling here, and I find it hard to believe that no one could know that all of this that transpired was wrong. I mean, there's just no way around it. It's just plain old wrong. You don't do this to children. So the plan was to, again, dump the children in this wildlife area. And then uh, apparently, you know, and these are descriptions that are coming allegedly from her confession. And then also, let's not forget, there are three children who were in the car and the oldest of which who survived, who also are going to be able to fill in the gaps. So the authorities say that the mother, Brittany, removed James from the car and that she tried to leave him there, abandon him, gets back in the car to drive off. James, little boy, six years old, he's in first grade. He's as scared as could possibly be is frightened that he's being abandoned, even though he's already allegedly been tortured for days, grabs onto the car because he doesn't want to be left there. And apparently while she's driving away and he's holding on for dear life, she, according to authorities, ran him over and killed him that way. So then she's left with having to make a decision, apparently, and there are a few different versions of this, but ultimately she goes back to get James. And uh, the, the, the version that we're being told by the police chief is that when she went back to get him, he was in the parking lot area. He was clearly dead, looked like he had a head injury. She takes him, puts him in the car and takes him home and then puts him in a spare room while she and her boyfriend come up with the next plan, right? Because they're this is all messed up for, for them now. Now they have a child, which is what I can't figure out is if their intent was to rid themselves of these children, isn't this like the plan accomplished, right? The child yes, is dead. Isn't that I, what you I, wanted? I know. And so you're wondering if there wasn't a point at which she began to have second thoughts, and decided to go back because she retrieves the two live children as well. So then she has two live children and she's only accomplished the killing of one of them if in fact that was the ultimate goal here. Mm -hmm. So 
it, they take some time, this is according to court records, to figure out now what the heck is going on. And, and this this took place over about 48 hours is the best anyone can figure. So the decision on how to get rid of the boy, now his body's never been found. James's body has never been found, which is, I think, problematic because we are essentially relying on her confession, anything that the boyfriend may or may not admit to, and then the two surviving children, who I believe are probably the best witnesses of all. Yeah. And the most credible here. So we don't know exactly the cause of death because he's never been found. Uh, police say that Brittany and her boyfriend tied a cement block around James's body and then dumped him in the Ohio River. Okay. Then, as part of this brilliant plan of theirs, according to court records, the adults also removed the hard drive from video cameras that were in the house, which is really fascinating. Man, if you could get your hands on these on these cameras, the story that I think they would tell. Yeah. So, so they, it's interesting, authorities use the term removed, not destroyed. So I think there's, you know, that's a very specific word. So they removed that along with some other evidence like ropes and tape and moved them to another location. So the question is, have authorities found them, found those items? Do they know? Um, and who would have told them all of this? Maybe even the kids knew this, right? It's very possible. Yeah. Okay. So the the couple still has to come up with a plan of what to do about the fact that they have now two children instead of three. Okay, this is the plan that the two allegedly hatched. We know for sure that Sunday morning they went to the police station and they reported that James is missing. They said they woke up and he had vanished. Okay, so the police start doing their due diligence, getting out the word to the community, a picture of James, what he was last seen wearing, and they start their effort to look for the child. Meanwhile... The authorities say, as they are questioning the couple about the details of what was going on, you know, you always ask, did something happen? You know, what, because if a child runs away, for example, usually there there's a reason. And apparently in this process, Mike, that's when the whole thing breaks down and the mother allegedly confesses by Sunday night to this horrendous crime and they stop the search. So this is also important in terms of whether or not uh, Brittany's, Brittany Gosney's um, confession will come in. If, in fact, that confession was given when she was not in custody, if she was simply at the police station to provide a statement and then ended up confessing, she does not only not have the right to an attorney, she doesn't have a right to Miranda warnings at all. Miranda rights only trigger when a person is in the custody of the police, meaning they've either been arrested or they are in a se setting that feels like an arrest. So if she's just there to provide a statement and then slowly that statement evolves into a confession while she is not in custody, she does not have the right to be read her rights or to an attorney and the statement would absolutely come in. That's fascinating. I didn't know that. So she would. Now, there's a gray area, though, if I heard you correctly, that uh, what if she's in one of those interrogation rooms? Is she, it is a gray area and it is looked at through what we call a totality of the circumstances. So if she is in that room and repeatedly asks to leave and they tell her to stay, that could be considered quasi custodial. If they lock the door that prevents her from leaving, that could feel like custody. If she repeatedly requests a lawyer and they deny her and harass her and harangue her into giving a statement, that could look like coercion and custody. So it is looking at the entirety of that environment. But simply being in an interrogation room um, when you have not been arrested, and providing a statement to the police, police, that in and of itself, being in that interrogation room, does not trigger the obligation to read Miranda rights. 
Fascinating. Okay. Well, since then, you know, obviously the two of them have been arrested and they've been held. Brittany has entered a not guilty plea by reason of insanity. That didn't happen until the most pre, until the most recent hearing. That did not happen on the first. Um, she has an attorney and he claims that she is not competent to stand trial. So the judge has ordered a psychological evaluation. Now, remember I said to you that Brittany claimed to have a learning disability. So I want to play this clip. And this is from her very first court appearance. And again, she appears to not understand what's going on. Now, just questioning doesn't mean that you don't understand. I'm, I'm using that term very loosely here. Obviously, I'm not using it in any legal capacity or, or anything like that, or even a judgment. You make your decision. We're going to play the clip. This is from Fox 19 TV. They've been covering this case wall to wall. So here's the clip. You like court appointed counsel, ma'am? I don't understand. You want to talk to a lawyer? Where's Officer Hoover? Well, he's not in here right now. What about well, I have a learning disability, so I'm not understanding what you're saying. She seemed to be communicating fine. She understands right from wrong. She understood her constitutional rights. Okay, Mike. So that's really our first look at her in the legal system. Yeah. And as you said, a learning disability does not necessarily mean she doesn't know right from wrong. Okay, so... As, as a defense attorney, the very first thing that you need to establish for yourself when engaging with the client is whether or not they are competent to understand the criminal proceedings. That is not an insanity defense per se. That is not about whether or not they're innocent of the charge. That is about their competency right there inside that courtroom. And if while you're speaking to someone, they are telling you they don't understand the process, they don't understand what a judge does, they don't understand what your job as their attorney is, you have an obligation as the defense attorney, whether or not they're malingering, whether or not they're making it up, you have an obligation to um, what we call declare a doubt to the judge in which you say, Your Honor, I have a doubt as to my client's competency as to whether or not they can understand what's going on. You haven't even gotten to guilt or innocence on the crime. And what will happen is the judge will send the individual out to be evaluated. And uh, psychiatrists, usually multiple psychiatrists, will evaluate them. And they will determine whether or not they're competent for that baseline proceeding of even going forward at all. So if Brittany has a significant learning disability that prevents her from right now understanding the proceedings, a judge could simply suspend all proceedings until either that competency is restored, okay, and often it's restored by medication if somebody is mentally ill, often it can be restored, or there have been charges that have been permanently suspended and, and an individual remains institutionalized for many, many years, not able to ever go forward and understand the proceedings against them. Okay, but Mike, this is a woman with actually four children because one child was already removed, according to reports, by child services. So was she not apparently competent to parent? If you are competent to parent and have an understanding of parenting and taking care of lives, then how is she not competent to yeah. understand what she's facing. Well, I think we right now um, perhaps have a claim in terms of her competency. What is causing her lawyer to make that claim? We don't really know. If she has an underlying mental illness, a mental illness, absolutely, if you go off medication, if it's untreated, um, and if it's combined with a learning disability, it is something that might not always be present and might be able to be masked through self-medication and then suddenly spirals out of control so that in this moment in time, uh, she is not competent. Okay. Obviously, I understand the suspicion around that because it serves her to now suddenly claim I don't understand, right? Right. But that's part of what a doctor's job is. A doctor's job knows 
that the patient may be manipulating and lying to them. And part of what the doctor's job is, is to pierce through that and to get to whether or not the person is actually competent. And I've had many clients who have claimed to not understand the proceedings be found competent because they were, in fact, just trying to game the system. But I don't want to just jump to that place with Brittany Gosney because there may really truly be significant issues here. And the crime is so horrific that you also wonder how a person who, and I believe this is the truth, although I I may be wrong, but I believe she does not have a criminal history. I, I imagine she's known in the community What becomes very important is who was she in the community? What kind of mother was she known to be? Because what also could really be at play here is if she gets engaged into a relationship with with Hamilton, who's older than her, and if she has these underlying learning disabilities, was he really controlling her? Was he brainwashing her to to, to an extent? Can she make that insanity claim? And then on the opposite side of that, can Hamilton, you know, and, and you're right, this video would be so telling for us. Can Hamilton claim, I didn't know anything about it till after the fact. I wasn't, I wasn't there. I wasn't part of it. And I only helped in the latter part of this. I helped dispose of the body because she came and this disaster had occurred. And, you know, I, I love her and I wanted to help her. And it was the wrong thing to do, but that's what I did. So they're each going to have these defenses where I think he'll probably claim that she did this without his knowledge and totally independent of him. Mm-hmm. And she'll claim that she was somehow under his control. And while that might not amount to an insanity defense, it could amount to some kind of a defense where he's controlling her. And it could play out similar to a battered women's syndrome mm-hmm. defense that people use, that perhaps he was terrorizing her to such an extent that she felt like she didn't have control and had to uh, follow his orders. And perhaps that is what she was doing. Well, immediately following the announcement that James had been murdered, obviously the small community got together and they started holding candlelight vigils and, and just, you know, publicly mourning the loss of this child. And it, it, within the, the, the confines of, this, of these vigils, you had Brittany's sister who made some public comments saying that the last time she saw James was on a video chat about a month earlier. And then after that video chat, that her sister cut off ties with the whole family. So that certainly is an indication that maybe something was wrong. Yeah. And then additionally, James does have a biological father who is mourning the loss of his child, wants justice, wants these two held responsible and the and as you can imagine we at least from this little bit that we know we know that there were options james could have gone to his father and that whole biological side right that's a, he exists he's there yeah. brittany has family there were options for the children But what also becomes very important is that if he had his biological father very involved in his life, I would imagine that the father had visitation rights, that they were in communication with him and communication with Brittany. It really is going to be interesting to see the history here. Did the father or the family members, her sister for one, prior to that month in which they apparently secluded and separated from from family. What was she like before that becomes so critical? Because if James's father reports that, in fact, Brittany was a great mother when they were together, up until very recently, he did not have concerns. He didn't report her to the Department of Children and Family Services. He never sought custody of James because he always believed James was in good hands. Did something suddenly spiral in this last 30 days, or something was happening where either um, Brittany had a mental illness and, and spiraled out of control into psychosis? Is it possible she was under uh, Hamilton's control and he was telling her what to do and cutting her off from the outside world and creating a very controlled environment in which she felt she had no choice? The interesting thing is, what was Brittany Gosney like 
before she cut off all ties with her family and the people in her children's lives. Because if she were this known, loving and devoted mother, then it really does make you question what did happen in that last month. Well, I have to remind you and everyone that, remember, a child has been removed from the house previously because of an issue. So if in order, it's very hard to get the attention of child family services, as we sadly find out in, in all of these crime cases yes, that we cover, right? Okay, it takes a lot for them to react. It takes a lot for them to remove a child from the home. So we don't know the details of that, of course, but I'm going to say that her background as a parent is not impeccable based on that. But why would they remove the one child and leave the other three in her care? I mean, that it begs that question as well. If a person is on your radar as an unfit parent, to the extent that you've removed one of her children, why are the other three safe? It is, and again, you're right, all of this is going to come out and it, it makes you believe that she was not a fit parent, but that somehow an investigation into her mothering of her remaining three children was not adequate. Mm -hmm. I also find it interesting that the police chief has said repeatedly that the mother, Brittany, has not shown remorse throughout this process. Of course, that's his opinion, but... I do find that very interesting. So yes. James Hamilton has another hearing coming up. That's going to be in mid-April. Don't forget, we're going to wait now on the reports on her psychological fitness. And Brittany's being held on $2 million bond. Hamilton's is $750,000. We will continue to watch this case for all the new details. Okay, Mike, it's time to go to our next case, which is really a baffling story. And I have to tell you, I can't quite fully understand it. That doesn't mean I always understand the cases, but this one I'm really having trouble following. So so if you at home were saying, Anna, this doesn't make sense, I'm sorry. I'm doing the best I can. Because <laughs> sometimes we just don't have all the information. So what, what we have in essence here, we have police in Missouri, New Mexico, and New Jersey trying to figure out if maybe they could have a serial killer in custody. And should they believe this man when he says he's killed a total of 16 people? Okay, so it's, it's incredible. 47-year-old Sean Lannon is facing, so far, one murder charge in New Jersey, and he is considered a person of interest in the deaths of four more people in New Mexico, and one of those people is his ex-wife. Remember, he has now confessed, allegedly, to killing 16 people. He was arrested in St. Louis, Missouri on March 10th and is currently in custody in Salem County, New Jersey for allegedly murdering 66-year-old Michael Dabkowski, who was found beaten to death with a hammer in his New Jersey home. So let's talk, we're going to talk first about the crime in New Jersey, and then we're going to kind of back into it because I don't know how else to do this story. Generally, I like to do things chronologically, but because of the way that the information has been released, I don't think that's possible. So we're focusing on the murder in New Jersey. Sean Lannon said that he killed Michael because Michael allegedly had sexually abused him when he was a child. Police say that he broke into the victim's home to retrieve sexually explicit photos. Apparently, the victim had mentored Sean through the Big Brothers program in the 1980s, and according to NewJersey.com, that's the allegation, and, and Big Brothers have not made any comment to the media, and NewJersey.com claims that the photos that he was trying to retrieve from the home were sexually explicit of the sexual assaults that were made allegedly against him. So if we take this on its face value as what's been reported there, I do see some logic, if, if this is indeed true, that you are 
done being manipulated by your alleged former abuser and that you want justice and that you want these photographs and these materials either back or destroyed. That part of this case is the only part that makes sense to me, if it's true. Yeah, I think first and foremost is that it's very suspicious, especially in light of all of the other crimes that Lannon is not only confessing to, but at least some of which there is evidence that he committed. You know, I, I, I think the name that might help now help us navigate this case is if you remember Andrew Kunanen, who I killed do. Johnny Versace. And um, Andrew Kunanen had gone on a classic killing spree which, um, you know, law enforcement is very careful to separate a serial killer from a spree killer. Um, a serial killer obviously kills in a specific way using a specific MO and looks for specific types of victims. And a spree killer is somebody who often um, has a grievance. Um, they're, they're often at maybe the end of their rope in their lives, either because of finances, medical reasons, for whatever reasons, and they decide that they are going to go and take out revenge on every person who they perceive to have wronged them. And that's what Andrew Kunana did, killing people that he both knew, people that he had met, and complete strangers that he killed only to help facilitate his crimes. And this looks very similar to that in terms of Lannon going out and killing people that he perceived to have wronged him. How true those allegations are, how true his own beliefs are, we don't know. But I would bet that when more research is done into Lannon and his present circumstances, we will find that there is addiction involved, that there is extraordinary financial straits involved, and perhaps health conditions and mental illness involved and that over the course of time he has built up all of these resentments anger rage toward these individuals and he just decided i've had enough they're i'm gonna i'm gonna go and get my revenge and um and it looks to me like andrew kunan and it's similar to what we saw in that crime back in the 90s that's interesting because if we look at the chronology of um the cases for which he is being investigated, the New Jersey component, the man who allegedly sexually abused him, we believe to be the last person that he would have killed on this spree. And it doesn't, I don't get the, if it's as he has allegedly confessed, it sounds like he may have killed four people in New Mexico, you know, gotten rid of the evidence there, gone to New Jersey, and then done this case, this crime, which he is being held for. So, yes, that's very interesting because if your motivation is to get rid of your abuser, everybody else doesn't really matter. Well, though, I would actually look at it a little differently, Anna. I would think that there was an instigating event, and this was true in Kunan, and he had gone initially to get revenge against an ex of his who was in a new relationship. And that was what seemed to really s spark the flame of violence. And so it might be the ex-wife that sparks the violence and he goes and he exacts revenge on her. And this begins him down this path of I'm going to now that I've done this, I'm going to go get everybody that's wronged me. And then that ends with his abuser, if it's his abuser, I don't want to say that because these are only allegations. Correct. And I don't want to disrespect the, the dead when we do not have evidence that, in fact, he's guilty of any wrongdoing. Um, and then he ends up, it just, the spiral begins after the first killing, which um, what I, at least what I know of Kunan, and I'm not an expert, but what I know of him is that he wanted initially to get revenge against an ex-boyfriend that spiraled out of control and then ultimately landed him in Miami, where Johnny Versace becomes his last victim and feels almost random, but then connected to his mania. Right. And so this could be true of Lannon's last victim back in New Jersey, that it starts with this need to get back at his wife 
and then ends with him getting back at all perceived down enemies. So how they captured him, which again is interesting because so we so we have the incident in New Jersey and he Lannon is uh, uh, took the victim's car and was apprehended in St. Louis, Missouri. Authorities there don't know why he was in Missouri. My guess, he was just driving through Missouri to get to New Mexico. But I don't know. I just, but of course, if you have someone who is, you know, charged with one murder and a person of interest in four others, you got to think, dear Lord, what happened in Missouri when we picked him up? Yeah. Okay. You can't just think everything is innocent and fine. Okay. So now let's go to the killings in New Mexico. So we have four people who are found dead in New Mexico. It is a very bizarre part of this. So the, the, okay, this is also, I know, right? I'm, and I'm sorry, people, it's hard to because describe. I'm, I'm no, really it sorry. Is. I mean, I like to think that I like, I take, what I love about crime cases is that they're giant puzzles. Put the pieces together, try and figure out, and look at the holes, look at the narrative. And this one is just like, I just, okay, here is what is interesting to me. So Sean Lannon was divorced from his wife, and they had three children together. But even though they were divorced, they lived in the same house together, divorced, with their three children. Okay? All right. So this is setting up what's going on in New Mexico. So according to the Associated Press, so Sean was divorced but married with Jennifer, and the couple was supposedly talking about moving back east. They're all from back east. And... Jennifer's brother, this is one of the one of the people, one of the four dead in New Mexico, said that, hey, you know, Sean had told the family early on, like in January, January, before anybody knows about anything, it's like, oh yeah, you know what? Jennifer just took off for a while. She's she's not here. She just took off. And the family's like, well, that's really bizarre. Why would she just take off? Because they have three children together. So so that's what's going on in January. And, but the brother is still saying, but they were good and co-parenting and they were working on getting back together. Well, that's his version of events. But th that may be what was going on, what their perception was. All right. On March 4th, this is very important because now we can really back up into this. On March 4th, Sean takes the couple's three children and their ages, four, six, and seven, two his parents' home in New Jersey. And then, keep in mind, in New Jersey, that is where that other murder occurred. Sean leaves March 4th. March 5th, security at the Albuquerque airport smells something weird coming from a pickup truck that seems abandoned. Authorities search the vehicle, and they find the remains of four people. Four people. One of them is Jennifer, his ex-wife, who he still lives with. And here are the other people in the pickup truck. So you have Jennifer, then you have 21-year-old Matthew Miller, 40-year-old Justin Matta, and 60-year-old Randall Apostolon. What's the connection between these four dead people? Okay, well, the easy, easy answer is Jennifer was friends with two of them. And then the 60-year-old man, Randall, was believed to have lived out on, you know, in, in his pickup truck, right? He lived in the pickup truck and he used his pickup truck to haul things and to give people rides. That's how he got by. All right. The more complicated answer as to how these four individuals are collected are connected if you're going to believe this scenario, which again, I don't know what to believe here because it's such a confusing case. Lannon allegedly told police during jailhouse interviews that his ex-wife and 
Mata, one of the other victims, were in a drug-fueled relationship that went awry one evening in late January. This brings us back to, oh, Jennifer just took off for a while. (laughs) (laughs) Lannan claims to have arrived at the house to find his ex-wife freaking out because she thought her three children were dead after she and Mata had medicated them so that they would fall asleep. I don't even know how much to believe of this. It could all be true. I have no idea. It's an extraordinary story. Then Mata is said to have left the house during this incident. Lannan's ex-wife then supposedly tried to commit suicide by overdosing on heroin. I don't even know where to take you to this next one, people. <laughs> I, I, I'm just... Okay, so apparently that didn't work because Lannan allegedly checks her pulse, and then he shoots her in the head. I'm sorry. I don't, you know, if if she's trying Seems to Seems like kill you should call 911. It's, <laughs> thank you, Mike. Rather than, right. I thank don't you, know Mike. if you've noticed that somebody has apparently OD'd and you feel that there's a pulse, the natural response would be to call 911 not to get a gun and shoot and kill them. That makes literally no sense. (laughs) It makes absolutely no sense. And this is why I find it interesting that when the the police back in New Mexico, they've been asked repeatedly, do you think he killed 16 people? Do you think he killed these four? He's like, is it possible? Sure. Do we know for sure? We have no idea. It's almost as if, and I'm reading between the lines here, that the police don't completely believe him. Yes. And what we often find um, with these spree killers, especially, is an extraordinary destructive narcissism. I mean, that's a lot of what's going on. They're the center of everything. They've been aggrieved by everyone. Um, There is uh, something about them that gets off on being the center of attention. And that might include being claiming responsibility for more murders than they've even committed uh, becomes a, a, a new expression of their uh, narcissism and self-absorption, as strange as that sounds. So the, the other part, Mike, before we get into more details of this case, um, some of this information was obtained through jailhouse interviews, say police. Some of the information was obtained by the eavesdropping that we have on calls from jails where Lannon was talking to a relative and spilling the beans on all of this. So I, I, that is admissible, right? Any of those conversations are taped? All jail calls um, are admissible um, unless they're between an inmate and his attorney. Those, of course, are privileged. However, if, the, if law enforcement is interrogating him um, and Lannon is not advised of his rights, um, then those statements to law enforcement could be excluded. Um, but there are some little, um, even loopholes there that if you are questioning an inmate for a cr- about a crime, for which they are not a suspect. Like let's say an inmate is in in custody on one murder, but not in custody on the murder that you're questioning him about. There may be an argument that they were questioning him about something completely different that he wasn't in custody for. So his Miranda rights still did not trigger on that Mm. separate murder. As, as, As odd as that sounds, there are still exceptions because often you might think if he already had a public defender or some kind of an attorney, they wouldn't be allowed to go in there and question him at all. That's not necessarily the case. It, the minute that I represent a client, the the first thing I do is advise law enforcement that they are to have no communication with the client about this or any other investigations or cases, because technically they can still go in and talk to clients on cases that are not related to the one they're in custody for. Okay, so keep in mind, everything that we're quoting here is coming from a combination of these conversations and interviews, which the authorities have released. Yeah. Okay, so let's get back 
to this crazy scene back in New Mexico because we're not done yet. So uh, at last we left this, he shot, he allegedly has shot his wife in the head. And then, then he says, I'm, he was about to shoot himself until one of the children cried out. And then that stopped him. Yes. Lannon told police that he then stashed his ex-wife's body and the bloody sheets in a backyard container. One week after that, Lannon claims that he lured Mata, the, the I guess the boyfriend, you know, part of the drug-fueled relationship, back to the house and shot him. Now, one would think if you didn't mean to kill your wife, you don't have to kill other people, especially when they're not even present. But you lure, you allegedly, you lure them back, lures them back, allegedly shot him in the back of the head. And this happened in the laundry room. Then Miller, okay, Miller, this is now the third person in the pickup truck and not the oldest man, the one who lived in there. Miller was allegedly the dead couple's drug dealer. He gets lured to the house over the course of the next week. And then, um, yeah, supposedly, Lana admits to shooting him in the back of the head. And, I mean, so he's, yes, there, please there help is, me. And, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's tough. There is, other than Apostolon, um, there is a common theme among the other murders. And the theme is that Lannan is both victim and hero. And that each of the people, each of his victims, essentially deserved to die. His wife for placing his children at risk and then trying to commit suicide. He only wants to put her out of her pain. Then decides he's even going to kill himself, but realizes his children need him and he needs to be there for them. He has to kill Mata because he placed, he turned his ex-wife into a drug addict and placed his children at risk and then kills Miller, perhaps alleging that he was providing the drugs that placed his children at risk and his wife at risk. He then goes back to New Jersey and kills his childhood abuser. So he places himself at the center of a kind of hero vigilante narrative. And I think that gives great insight into who Lannon is. I don't believe that much of what he's saying is credible in terms of what motivated his killings. And that I think the killings were probably more likely. And again, we know very little. And, I'm, uh, and I do understand that I'm speculating based on what we know. But it appears to me that they are perhaps more, more motivated by a, uh, a need to exact revenge against the people that he felt had wronged him. You could be right. You could be right. Um, so the, the story goes, whether this is from the jailhouse interview or whether this is from the conversations with relatives about what I've done, allegedly, Mata and Miller were dismembered with an electric saw that was borrowed. And then they were initially stored in plastic tote bags and put next to Jennifer's body. Lannon then allegedly transported the corpses to a friend's house and then had transferred each body into its own plastic bin. Then, supposedly, moved the bins to Albuquerque because where their home was was outside of um, the city limits. And then they were stored inside a vehicle that was adjacent to a different friend's apartment. I mean, basically, it's like I move it here and then I move it there and then yeah. I move. Okay, I'm, I don't want to lose you in the details of all this, but this gives you an idea that this is, if this is, if there's any accuracy to this, it is allegedly taking place over the course of a few weeks now. This is just not yeah. happening over the course of one day. This is now happening over the course of a, a few weeks. And that is very possible if the last time she was seen alive was January, and then he leaves with the children in March, that gives him almost two months to do, yeah. to do this, and, right? And, and, you know, insight into the motive and the conduct itself. What gives us insight into that is how he responds Right. He doesn't respond by calling the police or even by be becoming afraid and fleeing. He responds by dismembering the bodies and storing them at different locations 
over the span of weeks. And so the behavior after the event provides for me a lot of insight into what motivated the event itself. So at least the first three, if the story is correct, you see how they're all connected. Yes. And then there is Apostolon, the poor guy living out of his truck and earning money moving things. So as the story goes, Lannan claims to have hired him, this part makes sense, to move these bins with the, supposedly with the bodies, and that he got mad. Sean said he got upset because he was quoted one price. And then when it was time to pay, this poor homeless man dared to ask for more money. <laughs> and therefore, that could be why he was killed. We know for sure that he's dead. These four are dead. They've been found dead. They've been identified. That is not the issue. The question is, who killed them? And Sean Lannan is a person of interest in this quadruple homicide. And again, we go back to Andrew Cunanan as our example. One of the people that Andrew Cunanan killed was simply the owner of a car that he wanted to steal. And that was it. All right. So in, in the midst of killing people that he had these you know, perceived grievances against was the killing of somebody who simply facilitated the commission of his other more intentional revenge crimes. Apparently, there were some conversations that Sean Lannan had with authorities back in New Mexico when his wife disappeared. So it does not sound like he reported her missing. No one has said that yet. But clearly, the family was worried because they hadn't seen her. So this is what is being reported, that police say that he was questioned about his ex-wife's disappearance, and that during an initial interview, this is now in February, okay? Last seen January, interviewed by police in February, March, everybody's discovered dead. He said that Jennifer and Mata had run off together in order to obtain drugs, and most likely from Miller, but that he expected them to return. So he's already naming three people but everybody's coming back. So just a little bit more insight into the family dynamics here to try and understand what may have been going on between um, the former husband and wife. According to court records, the a couple's divorce and custody case showed that Sean is the one who was awarded sole custody of the three children, which is very interesting, and that there had been a protective plan from the New Mexico Children's Youth and Family Services Department that included only supervised visitation by their mother over concerns for potential neglect due to prescription drug abuse. But remember, even though the, they had already divorced, they were still living together. So that's just a little bit of insight. And, and again, often in these types of crimes, that in, in the context that I'm seeing this crime right now, um, often the grievances are real. And, and the grievance of the wife being a, a drug addict and, and if it were prescription medication, it is very common right now for prescription medication addictions to transition into heroin. And maybe she had taken that turn and, and maybe it was causing him extraordinary grief and pain and anger. Mm -hmm. Now, he claims that he's killed another 11 people in New Mexico. And the authorities in New Mexico have said, well, we don't really know whether we believe him because right now nothing is popping as 11 missing people that would fit into this part of his story. But we don't know, you know, it's yeah. still early on in that investigation. So I, the one thing is that in, this is now according to People Magazine, they're saying that in that phone call to relatives that he apologized and said he was so sorry for everything he had done. Uh, that could be. That could be. So all of this needs to be sorted out. But what we do know for sure is that 39-year-old Jennifer Lannon is dead, and she leaves behind a total of five children who have been left without their mother now. Yeah. And Sean's attorney, because there have been a few hearings already, says in defense of Sean, that 
what happened in New Jersey where his alleged sexual abuser was killed, that that was not a break-in. He was actually invited in and that it was the victim who provoked him, that he never went there with the intention of killing him, that something happened and it was he was basically defending himself. So that's where we stand with this case. I have a feeling that in the next few weeks, maybe even the next few months, because this is going to take a while, we will find out exactly what was going on in these two states with this family and um, all of these people who have yeah. been murdered. Crazy case. Crazy. It's time for our comment section with Owen Michael. Owen, what is everybody talking about on social media? Hi, guys. How are you doing? Uh, glad to see you this week. We, of course, uh, have our comments from Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. We read everything, so please stop by and offer your thoughts. This one we've <laughs> got, uh, this is out of Jacksonville, Florida. Um, this is a story about a woman named Edith Riddle. She showed up for a meeting with her daughter's vice principal. Uh, Edith had a boxing glove super glued on her left hand. She said she couldn't remove it. The meeting with the vice principal was about her daughter's hostile outbursts. Minutes after the meeting, Riddle and her daughter allegedly attacked a student in the school cafeteria with Riddle reportedly punching the student with her gloved hand. Oh, God. So some obvious questions about this situation here. And uh, <laughs> starting with Christina C. <laughs> says, uh, she's, she says, uh, mom shows up to a meeting with a boxing glove and they're all wondering where the girl's hostile outbursts are coming from. Good point. Uh, Beth K. says, there was a time when I wanted to fist fight children too. Some of them just ask for it. I'm not sure what's going on with Beth K. there. I'm hoping she's uh, talking about when she was back in grade school herself. And that's uh, sure it's a good idea to talk about fist fighting children. No. But uh, uh, our, our suspect this week did so, allegedly. Melissa P. says, so the principal actually sat through a meeting with a woman who had a boxing glove super glued to her hand. I'm finding that hard to believe as well. I'm curious as to uh, that what, how good that would have been to be a fly on the wall of that meeting. Um, someone shows up in your office with a boxing glove on their hand, just one. So maybe that wasn't as suspicious. Who knows? But, uh, you know, that's so weird, though, right, Owen? Because what is what is the principal in this case going to do, right? We've got a, a, a student who's allegedly shown aggression, and mm -hmm. then we've got the parent who has a boxing glove on, and that's not normal. And then we don't know whether he knew at the time that it was glued on. So now we're like, what the heck's going on here? Yeah, there was no testing for super glue in any of the uh, accounts <laughs> that I that I saw here. I mean, I have no idea if this woman, uh, you know, said I was just at the CrossFit. Uh, I was doing the, the my boxing gym workout this morning, and I have a head can cramp, or who knows? Um, seems like that would have been uh, kind of a cause for concern. However, with apologies to Florida, it was a Florida story. Uh, Michaela G also says this sounds like a Reno 911 episode. Um, different state, but uh, similar absurd television type situation here. So, um, yeah, you know. I, if I'm him, I I'm not sure I want to take her on and and get these two out of my office because I'm going to be a little scared about what I'm facing here because this what is a little unstable. What I like is the idea that her punching somebody is so consistently possible <laughs> that she has to have a glove permanently put on her fist for safety measures. You have to somewhat respect her level of responsibility. She, like, she knows that the danger is always there, that she's going to punch someone, that mm -hmm. she wants there to be some cushion to prevent serious injury. This like, is true. <laughs> super glue to her hand. Oh, my God. It's too much. Owen? Insane as always, but that's what our social media feed is for. <laughs> yes. Please stop by and uh, read and comment. Uh, we read everything, so uh, please do. You have to start doing giveaways. Uh, you're onto something. Yeah, I know, but we don't have anything. We need some merchandise, but uh, maybe <laughs> maybe some uh, you know some free shots or something like that. <laughs> oh, that's going to bring on the comments. All yeah, right, and with that, right. I say <laughs> that's our program for this week. <laughs> Bye, guys. See you next week. Bye, Mike. Thank you so much. We always appreciate your insight. You always like are able to explain everything to me, and I really love that. So, so oh, thank, thank you. Thank you for having me.
Where can people find you if they need a criminal defense attorney or if they just want to follow you on social media or they just oh, want to know what you're up to? They can just Google my name. Cavaluzzi is not a common name. If you write in Mike Cavaluzzi, information about me, some of my former videos, things that I posted online will automatically pop up. Terrific. Thank you. And I know you'll you'll come back soon. You, of course, can find me at Anna G News on uh, all social media, and that's Anna with one N. You can find our content on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Google Podcasts. And of course, you can watch us on our YouTube channel and get updates by subscribing to our newsletter at truecrimedaily.com. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We've got something like, what, 4.4 4 million people? Let's get some more millions of people. <laughs> uh, until next week, this is True Crime Daily, the podcast. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. And as we always say, don't do crime. Don't do crime.